So today I'm going to tell you about rather forward-looking um, points of view about one of the important directions where I see deep learning uh, going and having to go in order to uh, bridge some of the gap between where we are now and human level intelligence. And it's about higher level cognition and also agency. Um, but let's start from um, where I started uh, in this field uh, because of uh, what I call the amazing hypothesis that there might be a few simple principles that explain our intelligence and also could allow us to bring uh, intelligence to machines. So uh, if there are a few principles like this uh, to explain our intelligence, one of them, I mean, or many of them have to do with learning, right? Otherwise, uh, in order to explain the brain, we would need a huge bag of tricks containing all of the knowledge that we have. So it means that the, our knowledge is something somehow that through these principles we acquire from experience. And um, this idea that there's a single uh, simple set of principles like the laws of physics but for intelligence um, is interesting because not only it might help us build smarter machines but also it might help us understand better how the brain works and how cognition works. No problem. <laughs> Um, so, so what do we need um, to, to start thinking about these principles? If, if you want to summarize uh, in a few words some of the things we've learned with machine learning in the last few years, uh, what, what we need to describe something like a, a neural net is um, uh, an architecture, an optimization procedure, and, and an objective function. Most papers you read in, in deep learning can be summarized through these three or, uh, elements. So sort of a very compact description of things. Um, now, of course, um, there are lots more details about the brain and lots more detail about cognition that we don't know yet how to handle properly and how to understand. Um, what's interesting about neural nets in order to understand the brain is that they have a level of uh, uh, representation uh, uh, that can span both low-level questions about the brain, like uh, the, the details of learning rules happening in synapses, um, and, and the structure of local computation in, in what's called uh, cortical columns, up to very, very uh, high-level questions of the kind I'll spend more time on today that have to do with cognition, with attention, with memory, with language, with uh, causality and agency and consciousness and so on. So, so these are the kinds of questions um, that you can also uh, express in designing particular neural net architectures and training formalism. Um, and interestingly, there's been already a lot of inspiration in the design of current deep learning uh, coming from, from living intelligence. So, of course, the neural nets themselves come from neuroscience, but uh, things like the idea of a distributed representation, the fact that a, a concept is not represented by a single unit, but by a pattern of activation, for example, comes from observing what we see in the brain. Uh, the architecture of uh, convolutional nets comes from observing the visual cortex. Um, the kind of nonlinearity that we are using in neural nets, uh, the ReLUs, for example, which uh, really came from neuroscience and we tested in uh, neural nets in the, around 2010, uh, really is, is something people usually don't know, but really comes from uh, neuroscience. Um, the idea of spikes, we haven't yet completely integrated that, but actually we have things in deep learning that are really much inspired from, from spikes, like uh, dropout, where you introduce noise that shuts off some of the units randomly, or the work that's been done in quantizing the activity of neurons in order to reduce energy, again, something that brains have to deal with, and, 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 and many other aspects. Um, so now let's uh, talk about the state of deep learning so that we can get into our subject of higher level cognition. Um, we've made huge progress, um, much more than even my friends and I expected a few years ago. But it's uh, in some areas of uh, 
of cognition of intelligence. It, it's, it's mostly about perception, things like computer vision, speech recognition, and synthesis. Uh, some uh, things in natural processing we're doing well, but we're still far from uh, human capabilities and, and that uh, domain, playing games, of course, like the game of Go. Um, and then, um, you know, with all the success we've had, some people think that, well, we're done. Like, we just need to scale things up. If we just have larger data sets, bigger models, uh, faster chips, uh, we're going to build intelligent machines with the kind of algorithms we already have. Uh, I don't think so. I think there are actually many um, pieces in, in the puzzle that are missing. And uh, that's the kind of thing I want to be brainstorming about with you. Um, so, so why do I think so? so? So there are some fundamental ways in which I think we are lacking. Uh, in terms of the symptoms of this, we can see that um, what we call sample complexity is not, is not good. So the number of examples that you need with a, a machine learning system to learn a new task is for now uh, much higher, much worse than uh, what, say, a human needs. So if, of course, there, there's, there's no magic here. Like, uh, humans are able to learn a new task quickly from very few examples because they already know so many other things that they've learned previously. And so if we're going to solve this problem in machines, it's going to be the same thing. We're going to build machines that know a lot of things about the world, and then uh, when they're presented with a new task, and, and maybe just a few examples of it, uh, they'll be able to do as well as humans eventually. Um, another aspect is that if you look at the state of the art systems, the industrial systems that are deployed out there, they, they use humans in very uh, important ways to help define what are the high level concepts that the machine is supposed to know about. So when we label images and we say, this is a cat, this is a dog, this is a chair, it's the human who decides what the high-level concepts are. And, and then the machine learns to map the raw, the raw data, like pixels, into these high-level concepts. But, but babies, for example, are able to figure out lots of things in a completely autonomous way. Um, not, I mean, even things that they figure out uh, that their parents don't tell them anything about. So for example, babies figure out how um, physics works. Like they understand. Um, uh, gravity, they understand pressure, they understand solid objects, and, and their parents don't start telling them about these things, right? They just observe, interact with the world, and so on, and build the right abstract concepts in, in a way that's pre-linguistic, and that's intuitive. So, um, so that's something we need to figure out. Uh, also, if you look at the kinds of errors that the current systems make, when they make errors, and they do, uh, they are very different from the kinds of errors that uh, humans make. In fact, often they seem to indicate that those systems rely on fairly simple clues about the, um, the, the, the input, like uh, let's say classifying an image of, uh, of a cow using the color of the background. So often it's going to be green because pictures of cows tend to be on green pasture. But if, if they suddenly see a cow um, in, a, in a beach, then they might not recognize the cow. And this is actually the kind of mistake that happens. So um, let's see, uh, you know, some uh, some some possible directions for trying to approach human-level AI uh, and go beyond these limitations. Um, yeah, uh, uh, one little remark before we go there. Um, so I, I hear so often journalists or all kinds of people ask me. So okay, so deep learning was great. What's the what's the next thing? Um, and what I answer usually is, I believe that the, the, the next thing is just like we normally do in science, is going to grow on top of the concepts we've built in our toolbox of, of science. So we found a lot of interesting things, like I, I mentioned uh, the idea of distributed representations, the, the importance of depth, uh, having multiple levels of representations, um, the uh, uh, optimization methods that we use that are working a lot better than we thought they should. Uh, so the, the idea of end-to-end -end training, for example, so, so there are a lot of important concepts that we already know in this set of principles that uh, we think are necessary for intelligence. Um, and what I think is going to happen is we're going to put more things in this toolbox that allow us to go to uh, tasks and uh, types of um, intelligence that we, we don't master yet with, with deep learning. So what, what, what is it um, that, that we're missing? And uh, 
that I want to focus a bit of the discussion on for, for today. So one of the most practical aspects, so it's not about how it's done, but the, the outcome. So that's something I mentioned already, like sample complexity, that the ability to generalize from few examples uh, uh, when you're learning a new task. Um, another thing I didn't mention, but is maybe even more important, humans are able to generalize in a way that's more powerful than current machine learning in the sense that we can generalize to what we call out of distribution uh, data. In other words, data that doesn't look like your training data. When I tell you a story of uh, something uh, hypothetical, like a science fiction story, you can easily understand the story, you can imagine what's gonna be the, the, the end of the story if I tell you the beginning, uh, even though it's a nonsensical story, like it's not gonna happen in the real world. So under your life experience, it's an impossible thing, right? Um, but humans have no problem with that. We, we, can, we, can, we can do what's, what uh, mathematicians call counterfactuals. We can imagine what if such and such thing was true, what would be the consequences, right? And this doesn't fit well with the, the framework of machine learning, where we assume that there's one data distribution, and then we're gonna collect um, some random part of it, it's gonna be our training set, and we're gonna hope that we're gonna train a machine applied on data from the same distribution. But if I, if I show you an example, like a story, that comes from a, a different distribution that it doesn't even overlap with your training distribution. Right? In other words, it has zero probability under your training distribution. How could the machine possibly generalize? But humans can do it. And they can because somehow that story, that science fiction story that I told you, or that, that you imagined that I told you, um, and is, is, is told using concepts that you know. Right? It's recombining pieces of knowledge that you already know in ways that are unusual, but still you can make up what the meaning is. Okay, this is something that linguists call systematic generalization, uh, which we know humans are able to do, and that seems to be hard for current machine learning systems. We have recent papers studying this, and we can see that uh, uh, they, will, they, they will not generalize well, so there will be a, a severe drop in performance when you do these kinds of things on them. And this has practical importance because, let's say, uh, you consider uh, an industrial deployment of machine learning. It's trained on data that was collected under some circumstances, maybe in the lab or something, and then uh, it's going to be deployed in some uh, other circumstances. Maybe it's trained on data from one country and it's going to be deployed in another country. Or uh, think about um, very rare cases. So, so one example I like is uh, you know people are trying to build uh, autonomous vehicles, and uh, it's going to be very difficult to collect a lot of data about very rare and dangerous situations, like accident situations. Uh, so, how do humans manage to uh, uh, drive even though they haven't been exposed to a lot of uh, personal data of uh, these rare dangerous situations? Like you know. Uh, I, I had actually only one serious accident in my life when I was 18, and before, or 20 actually, 20. So, uh, and, and, and before that accident, of course, I had zero examples of a uh, really dangerous situation. And then for the rest of my life, I drove with a single example, okay? Uh, <laughs> and, and I guess it worked because <laughs> I haven't done any more accidents. So, um, you know, when you're young, you know. Um, but anyways, the point is we can generalize from, um, so, so how did I do it, right? Well, even before I had an accident, I could imagine what could happen, right? I, so I, 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 could, I could imagine what would happen if I broke in the middle of the highway, uh, pushing the brakes, and uh, the, the car behind me, you know, hit me or something. Right? So I can, I can create fake situations in my mind. Um, this kind of thing we don't have right now in our models, right? Um, but we can, we can imagine those things and we can design models that would have these properties. These, these things are part of what uh, psychologists call system two cognition, the ability to reason, the ability to consciously uh, construct hypothetical scenarios, future possibilities, potentially um, think about uh, a, a, somebody who is uh, trying to explain a murder, right? So some, some, sometimes it's about the past. We're trying to imagine what happened that could explain what we saw, right? 
or what might happen in the future if I do this or that, right? So this kind of thing, um, we're starting to build into our, our machine learning systems, but, but we have a long way to go. And it's connected to another aspect which we don't do very well in machine learning right now, which is uh, deal with causality. So causality is something interesting because it's fundamentally more than uh, just capturing the structure of the data distribution. So the joint distribution of all the things we observe is what normally machine learning is about. Machine learning has been about figuring out the dependencies, the statistical dependencies between variables, being able to predict one thing from another thing. But causality contains one more piece of information, which is that A is cause of B and B is cause of C and so on. And it turns out that it's, uh, it, it's not enough to know the joint distribution in order to figure out information that you have in the causal structure. And it doesn't matter what the causal structure is so long as you only care about one distribution because that's the thing. But that's the, the fixed uh, distribution. You know, have the joint distribution, you know everything you need to know. But if the distribution is going to change, like somebody comes in the room and closes the lights, all right, uh, now the pixels coming to my eyes are going to be very different. And somehow, um, I need to adapt my model of the world. Maybe it's going to be dark in order to cope with that. Um, there was a cause and effect um, thing there where, where an agent uh, intervened in the world and modified one little thing that had a big effect on, on many other things. And, uh, and, and most humans will be able to cope with that change without having to relearn everything. Whereas our current machine learning systems tend to be uh, fragile to these things and you basically have to retrain them on, oh, well, okay, so now I have to collect data on dark rooms, right? Um, we don't want that. Um, and, but, but if we uh, build models that capture this, uh, okay, let's put this one down. <laughs> Two examples, yes. Well, now I know it doesn't work to put it there. Um, so, so causality I'll tell you more about. Um, another thing that is missing and that uh, lots of people um, think about is um, uh, common sense. And we don't even know how to define that. But basically, there are the things that um, people know and uh, that help them really understand when I speak. When, when somebody reads a sentence, they use their understanding of how the world works to capture what the true meaning of that sentence is. And some of that meaning isn't something easily accessible to machines. So um, I'll come back to that. And there's an uh, interesting notion in psychology uh, that I'm going to talk about, system one and system two. System one is all the intuitive stuff that we know but we can't communicate and uh, all of the computation that is unconscious, whereas system two is the rest, so what is conscious and that we can verbalize. Um, so with language, we can communicate things that are accessible to our system two computation, but there's a lot of things going on in our mind to which we don't have access. And, and so some of the common sense is this knowledge that we don't even communicate with language. So even if we train a machine with an infinite amount of text, it wouldn't have access to that kind of uh, system one knowledge. All right. So, so let's go back to what deep learning is about on, on that quest to answer these many questions. And we are only going to scratch the, the surface in this hour, obviously. Um, the reason I got so excited about the ideas of having uh, deeper neural nets in the beginning of this century is because we thought that we would be able to train multiple levels of representations where the higher levels would correspond to more abstract aspects of the world. Right? That's the appealing thing. So what does it mean more abstract? Um, it means that somehow it connects with the, the underlying explanations for how the world works, for, the, for the data we're, we're talking about. Uh, for example, for the causal factors that explain what we're seeing. And also the high level of representations there, these more abstract things, tend to be what we communicate with language. Right? Um, but we don't, we don't have that yet. We, we have deep learning and we are able to sort of rise that ladder of abstraction, but we haven't reached the, the kind of level 
that humans uh, are good at and, and, and uh, communicate uh, with language. Um, and one of the things I, I believe about this problem, um, also known as discovering disentangled representations, in other words, to separate these high-level factors from the raw data, is that in order to do that, we need to put more constraints, more pressure, um, more priors uh, on what the representations uh, should be. Uh, we need to say something about what the kind of representation um, we should have at that highest level. And so there, there are many clues that we could use. Um, right now, what most people in the field of disentangling representations focus on is uh, the idea that the high-level factors are independent of each other. I personally think it's too strong of an assumption. Uh, it's like the word uh, fork and knife, uh, they're not independent. They come together often in the same sentence. So um, there are dependencies between the high-level factors, but they, they are somewhat simple. They can be summarized, for example, in uh, you know, sentences that involve only a few words at a time. So these are some of the things that I'll, I'll discuss a bit later. And, um, and also, the high-level factors tend to be uh, related to agency and causality. So many of the words that we use have to do, uh, correspond to aspects of the world that can be either the cause or an effect of something, or how one cause uh, influences uh, an effect, uh, which has to do with how agents, humans, animals, and, and so on, uh, um, influence the world through their actions. So, so that's actually the notion of affordances, which psychologists have been studying for, for many decades. Um, and uh, the idea of affordances, as I interpret it, is that the way we think about objects in the world, the, think, the way we think about high-level uh, entities in the world, uh, like, say, I think about a door, um, is, really, is not really about its shape or uh, its color or its texture, usually it has more to do with how I interact with that object. So a door is something I can open to go from one room to another room. Right? So this, this is the idea of affordances, that, it, that the, the attributes of object that matter to humans and the way that we represent them at a high level has more to do with their, uh, uh, the way that we act on them or that we might be acted upon by them than um, uh, their like, uh, precise physical characteristics. So you know, like a chair is something you sit on, right? It doesn't matter what the shape of the chair is. So long as you can sit on it, it's a chair, right? Um, and so the, the, uh, this, is, this is a direction that we started exploring in, in the last couple of years uh, to uh, define objective functions for unsupervised learning of agents that um, uh, encourages the representations of uh, the world to uh, sort of be broken down into dimensions corresponding to aspects of the world which agents can control. So it has to do with agents doing things and when I control one aspect of the world, like I can move this around, um, what it says, uh, what, what this principle says is there should be, in my mind, like a very easy to obtain um, quantity that corresponds to this aspect that I can control. So the position of the microphone must be something like easily accessible in my mind. And, uh, and I can actually make up a policy, so a sequence of actions, which can specifically target a particular aspect of the world which I want to control. Because this is the thing we, we you know, the basic thing that babies try to do. If you have babies, you know they want to control you. Um, they want to control everything, right? So we want to control each other and so on. I mean, it's not like nice to say this, but uh, there are other things going on. But that's, that's one important aspect of how we are motivated to try and explore and, and, and uh, helps us to plan around. Um, so affordances comes from psychology and uh, it's, it's now we're trying to turn that into mathematical formulas that we can use in deep learning and I could have sketched that a little bit. Another really, really important concept coming from uh, psychology and neuroscience is the concept of attention. In fact, I think this one is probably the core concept that's going to uh, unlock our ability to extend deep learning to higher level cognition. So, so what is attention, first of all? Attention is uh, simply 
the fact that uh, computation is going to be uh, uh, focused on a few elements at a time, and then sequentially we're going to move on to different elements as we uh, as, as our attention you know, flows from one thing to another thing. Attention is not necessarily on the outside. So people usually think of attention like, where do I look? Yeah, that's one form of attention. But a lot of what matters for attention is inside. In other words, um, of all the thoughts, of all the concepts, of all the perceptions, although of all the emotions that might be floating in my mind, there are just one or two at a particular moment that, that my consciousness is focusing on. So using attention, attention is sort of a selective thing that puts a highlight on one thing at a time. And, um, and it turns out that uh, it really, really makes a difference in many uh, natural language tasks. So in 2014, we uh, discovered that if we introduce a form of attention in uh, recurrent nets to perform machine translation, uh, we had a huge improvement um, and the reason is that when you translate a long sentence or think about translating a whole book into uh, a, another book, um, you don't want to do something like read the whole source book and have some representation of it and then generate the, the output book. That, that's not going to work. Like you, you can see it's not going to work. I mean, your mind is, is going to blow up. But what you can do is you can read the whole thing and then you can start producing the translated book one word at a time, or one sentence at a time, but at each step, you want to keep track of where this is supposed to correspond to in the source sentence or the source book, right? This is how you would translate a book. You would keep a pointer. So a pointer is attention, right? Attention is focusing on one thing at a time. And, uh, and so the, the thing that we, I mean, this is not a new idea, attention, but what happened in, in, around those, those, those times is that we found a way to train a mechanism with attention by making it what we call soft attention. So we actually put attention, you think of attention as a, a score we compute on every possible element in a set. And we're gonna have these uh, continuous quantities, these scores, um, and they're gonna compete with each other. So you know, there's gonna be one thing that wants to be dominating the others, but it's not gonna be one uh, or zero. And because it's gonna be this graded thing, we can, compute gradients through these computations. We can, we can compute how, if we had put a little bit more attention there and a little bit less there, how things would have been better or worse. Um, and that allows us to learn where to attend. Uh, given some context, what is the right attention, uh, the, the right form of attention, the right place to attend? Uh, and that really makes a big difference, of course. So the, we don't need to tell the machine where to attend. We don't need to invent all kinds of heuristics and rules to tell the machines where to attend. It, it just learns the weights of a neural net, which outputs a score for every possible element of where to attend. And the neural net takes as input whatever context information is, is, is important um, in order to, um, to, to perform a particular task. Um, Another interesting aspect um, from psychology and neuroscience, of course, is, is memory, something that people have started to incorporate in, in neural nets. We call them memory extended neural nets. Maybe one of the first uh, ones is the neural training machine, again, from about the same time, 2014. Um, I think this is something that we haven't yet uh, figured, uh, and we actually made more progress on attention than on memory. Um, but but it's, uh, it's clearly something that we use uh, as humans. Uh, we have many different kinds of memories. Uh, we know some parts of our brain, like hippocampus, uh, which uh, stores episodic memory, so the, the actual things you did in, in your day or, uh, or, and so on. Um, and, uh, and we haven't really found a satisfying way to incorporate this sort of mechanism in, in neural nets, but um, Interestingly, it's also connected to attention. So people will use um, a, a, a scoring mechanism, just like for attention, to decide uh, um, which memories, which, which memory cell, if you want, uh, should receive, um, uh, should, should be the places where you read or you write to. Um, and uh, in a paper we published last uh, in Europe, we uh, proposed actually a particular way 
to take advantage of, of memory in order to do credit assignment. So one of the big mysteries um, uh, today about how brains can learn um, uh, to do credit assignment through time, in other words, how to learn how a sequence of actions or a sequence of uh, computations in the brain uh, can lead to good or bad results. Um, uh, in in uh, computers, we can do backprop through time. This is a standard technique from, from the 80s, which is a, just a particular application of, of the principles of backprop through a sequence of computations. Um, but it, it's not plausible for, for brains, because uh, it would require that brains store their own history in a sort of side memory uh, and then play it back. Um, it, it, you know, it doesn't seem reasonable. Like, uh, it w you would need like uh, uh, 10,000 copies of your brain to store for the day, and then during the night maybe you play them back or something. It just doesn't work. Um, so, um, and, and also there are issues with backprop through time, which uh, I, I've studied for a long time. Um, so, so it's interesting to ask how, how um, humans might do that. And, um, and so, actually, we found a way to use attention um, in order to, I think, solve the problem of, uh, um, of uh, vanishing gradient, which, which plagues back prop through time. Um, instead of playing back the history, uh, going through all of the computations that happened in your, in your days, eh? um, in order to figure out how I should change the way I thought you know, 12 hours ago, um, I can just remember what happened 12 hours ago. And um, so let me tell you a story. I like stories. Everybody likes stories. That's how we understand. Um, let's say you're driving your car, and you hear a pop sound, right? And um, you, know, you notice it. It goes into your memory. And maybe you think, oh, what is it? Could it be like a flat tire? Or maybe you just discard that thought, and you continue driving. And then later, uh, you stop your car, maybe because you need to put some gas, and you notice that there is a tire that's almost flat, right? And then you think, oh, gee, I should have stopped uh, when I heard the pop sound. Probably that was it. So what happened in this story is you did credit assignment through time. You figured um, what was the cause of something you observe now, and you went back into your memory. You picked one thing. It's like you skip through hours and hours of, of driving. You don't need to simulate every single instant that happened during all that time. You just jump through time. You know, your memory is a time machine. Um, and, and somehow by associations, because your reasoning brain is able to associate the, the sound with the, the fact of puncture and so on, you can associate that particular memory with the observation of the, the flat tire. And, um, and then you can just sort of, sort of backprop through that access in memory so that now you think, well, if I had been doing this again, uh, I should act differently. And so you can, so we, we, we implemented something like that in a simplified way, um, illustrating this, this principle at the, in this paper. Um, all right, so I, I promised that I would talk about system one and system two because it's really important in uh, uh, the structure of my presentation today. By the way, somehow I don't have my, my phone and I don't have time. I mean, I don't have like a clock, so I don't know if somebody's going to show me uh, how many minutes left. How are we doing? 25 minutes left? So it's, you mean it's 4.35? Okay. Be careful. All right, so, so I mentioned already, so this is uh, uh, something, if you really want a good book, uh, read this book from Daniel Kahneman, uh, Thinking Fast and Slow, which describes the, the system one and system two in a, a glorious details. And it also tells you about the, the biases of, of uh, human cognition, a very, very interesting book. Um, but, but this idea, so the fast and the slow correspond to system one and, and system two. So system one is the fast, and it's, but I don't like the term fast and slow, but, uh, or one and two, actually. I would rather call it the, the unconscious system and the conscious system. It's much clearer what we're talking about. Um, so uh, the, the, the unconscious system, 
the things you can do in half a second, the uh, things uh, that are automatic that you don't need to think about, like when you drive, so let me give you another example of driving. I guess this is not good for uh, greenhouse gases, but um, let's say um, you're driving um, to your home and you're in your city, you know the place. You don't need to think about what you're doing. You just drive. And, like, your body does it and you can have a discussion with your friend sitting next to you. Um, so that's system one, right? It's completely automatic um, and um, you don't need any reasoning or planning or anything. Whereas system two is, oh, gee, you're driving in a new city and, oh, gee, my uh, data plan doesn't come here. I don't have Google Maps. Uh, so maybe you had a chance at the hotel to check the map and now you remember roughly what you have to do and you have to look at the signs and you have to think through, okay, should I go left, right, where am I? Uh, what's the good way of going there? And so all of that uh, conscious thinking, reasoning, imagining what could go wrong and so on, um, that's system two. All right? Also when you're programming a computer, that's system two. I mean, not only because you have some intuitions as well when you program, but, but uh, the things that you're able to express verbally, the things that you're able to express formally, when, when I describe, or when, I, when I explain somebody like how to do a long division, right? So that's, that's a recipe that I can do in my head, like if I ask you 31 plus 42, right? You can do it in your head and you're gonna go through steps, you're gonna do the first digit and then the second digit, right? And you're gonna store intermediate quantities. So, so that's system two. And current deep learning is really good at system one. Um, normal programming is really good at system two. Problem, um, it, it's really good if you know what you want to do, right? So if we need to learn what the system two thing is supposed to do, then we're in trouble. And there are other problems with system two. Um, so good old fashioned AI was essentially trying to do system two things, reasoning, logic, and so on. Um, but it requires really, really expensive computations, like searching through uh, millions of paths, like the, the good old way of doing uh, playing chess, for example. Um, but, but it's not the way humans play chess. Like humans actually combine system one and system two. So the way humans play chess is they have intuitions about, oh, this is a good move. And of course, they can also plan, like if I do this and he'll do that, but, but instead of having to explore a zillion possible uh, paths of he does that, I do that, he's a da da da, we just look at three or four and that's it, or even one, right? So, so we combine the two things, and, uh, and that's something we need to do in, in the future as well. Consciousness, all right, dirty words. Um, so, so this is, this is a, a word that's very loaded and uh, has been, uh, for the most part, the realm of um, philosophers for many years. But neuroscientists and cognitive neuroscientists are starting to try to put a bit of science behind this. And I think it's time that machine learning as well. So, um, so really consciousness is about different kinds of functionalities in your brain uh, that we should be able to decompose, understand, and then have machines be able to do that. Um, and um, in particular, I've been talking about attention, and I think this is maybe the most interesting aspect of consciousness. The ability that we have to uh, sequentially uh, focus on different aspects and attend um, just the right things, what we have in mind at the particular moment, um, that's access consciousness. And, and the things that we're thinking about that we've selected with attention, they become like dominant. They, it's like they take the center stage and everything else in your brain uh, gets informed of what you're thinking and conditioned by that. So, so that's the kind of thing I, I, I want to implement. And there are other aspects which I won't talk about today, but, but I think they also can be uh, cast in uh, machine learning terms. So, so I wrote a paper about some of my early ideas about this a couple of years ago. It's called the consciousness prior. And, um, and it says that the high levels of representations on, in our deep nets, we should really think of two high level 
states. So, so there is the usual high-level state which um, kind of captures uh, at a high level everything we're perceiving. So there's a, a neural net, say an encoder, that maps the input to this high-level uh, and high-dimensional unconscious state. And then the conscious state is sort of a selected sub part of it, which is what we're currently thinking about. So I call that the conscious state. And, um, and of course, the conscious state then becomes an input for further processing. Um, I don't know if you, you guys have um, uh, looked at the uh, gorilla video with attention where uh, they ask you to count how many passes are made with the ball uh, among the white players. And there's a gorilla going through the scene, and you don't see it. You don't see it because you're counting the balls. And you really don't see it. I mean, of course, the next time, so I'm sorry I spoiled it for you. <laughs> uh, next time you actually check the gorilla, right? So, so it influences our perception, but uh, it, it also influences, of course, more importantly, our, our decision making, um, you know, um, our, our actions. Um, another thing that's interesting about this, uh, I mean, the reason I call it a prior is because I, I I think of this selection of a few variables at a time as a way to constrain the sort of dependencies, the statistical dependencies or in the, and the causal dependencies that exist between those high-level variables. So at this high level, this unconscious state, there, there are like many aspects of the world, many objects that you could be thinking about. And you just select a few that make up like the current thought, like one sentence that is in your mind now. And, and, and the statistical dependencies between all of these variables is articulated by all of these possible thoughts you could have. Um, and they form a particular kind of uh, uh, probabilistic dependency, which we call a sparse factor graph, which, which is not something you would necessarily expect uh, of any joint distribution. Um, so it's a, it's a prior on the distribution. So let me go back to language because consciousness is very tightly connected to language. Um, although I do think my intuition right now, I can change my mind, is that I do think that animals which uh, do not speak, I mean, there's a bit of communication, but don't, animals don't have language uh, for the most part, um, still have consciousness. And so I think that language came on top of uh, consciousness that was evolved for other reasons and then it became when, once you have this consciousness a, a tool in your, in, your, in your brain then um, because you're only focusing on a few things at a time it becomes easy natural to just communicate those things that you're currently focusing on and, and, and so uh, I think that's, that's the way it happened for us um, but um, but let me go back to, to how we could build machines that understand language. Because right now, as I said, we have machines that can be trained on huge quantities of text, more than any human could read in their life, and still make really stupid semantic mistakes. Um, so I think what is missing, as I said at the beginning, is that in order to understand natural language, you need to also have a model of the world. You need to have somehow an understanding of the, the intuitive part uh, about how things work in the world. And so what, what researchers have been, uh, a few people, and then this is one of the papers uh, we, we worked on recently at the last iClear, uh, I've been uh, looking at, it's called grounded language learning. So, so you don't just learn from texts, you learn jointly from text and what text is referring to. So people have been looking, for example, at images and texts. Or in this case, we're looking at an agent, like a, in a game, in a virtual game, which can see part of the game, this is the, the gray part, and moves around and sees which objects are present and so on and tries to accomplish a mission which is given in natural language. And so it, it has perception, it has actions, it builds an understanding of its environment through these actions and, and observations, but they are also connected to language because it's gonna get reward if it does the things that we ask, the, ask it to do. So, so I think this is the kind of investigation that we need to do more of in order to build 
language understanding systems, which um, have an internal understanding of what language refers to. Um, so there's, there's one thing in, in language that's interesting, and that's our, the ability that we have to reuse the pieces, like the words and the phrases, in, in completely novel ways. That's what I mentioned that at the beginning, this ability of humans to, to generalize to new combinations. Um, so it's a form of compositionality. Compositionality, if you're a computer scientist, is, is a very basic notion if you study a little bit of theory in, in, in computer science. Uh, and it turns out to be also a central notion to understand why machine learning can generalize. Um, in the work that we've done in the last uh, uh, decade, approximately, we, we showed that actually deep nets enjoy uh, some particular forms of compositionality which explain why having deeper networks can generalize better and why having these distributed representations where at each layer you have multiple features um, that are uh, not competing but, but sort of uh, jointly representing a pattern of activations, uh, that actually buys a sort of exponential uh, ability to generalize it to new configurations of these features or um, um, uh, new uh, forms of inputs that, that correspond to, um, uh, say, for example, patterns that you haven't seen before. But humans, uh, when they reason, when they use language, they use another kind of compositionality, which you don't get with the, these neural nets. I'm going to try to explain that. So, so what we are able to do that current deep learning doesn't do well is a, a compositionality that happens on the fly. Right? So, so in a in a um, the back thing, yeah, in a in a in normal neural net, the computation is fixed. After you've trained, each layer just sends its output to the next layer, and it's always the same computation that's going to be done. Um, whereas, if you think about attention mechanisms, what it allows us to do is to decide on the fly which concept are going to come together into a thought. And, uh, and then what's going to be the next thought. So, so it's like we're chaining computation, but the sequence is dynamically selected by the attention mechanism. And, and when we program, when we have if then else, you know, uh, conditional statements and so on, we do that all the time. When we call a function and we provide arguments, that are specific to that call, but, but you know, from one call to another, it might be a different set of arguments. And then we compose these functions together, like the, the output of that function becomes the input of that function. But it's not always the same sequence, right? It depends on the context using the structure of the program. So, so this sort of compositionality that's dynamic isn't something that we have right now. And, and I think it could help us to, uh, to, to generalize beyond the training distribution. Um, so for that, we need to be able to decompose our knowledge into pieces that can be recombined on the fly. Right. This, is, this is a requirement for, for this dynamic computation to, to happen. Um, and so we, uh, we are on our path to do this kind of thing, and, and, and people have been, maybe one of the first papers on this comes from um, um, Berkeley uh, 2015 on modular neural networks. Uh, and, and, and there are a few papers in that line of thought. But, but I think we're going to go and see more of these things. And, and the last paper we worked on is called Recurrent Independent Mechanisms. Um, and uh, it's a particular form of recurrent net in which instead of thinking of, as usual, the neural net as one big homogeneous group of neurons, it's like we've broken the network into modules, blocks. And we're going to dynamically decide which blocks get activated at each time step and how they're going to connect to each other. So even the pattern of connections changes on the fly. And there's an attention mechanism which decides um, uh, for a particular block where it's going to get its input uh, for the next time step, from which the output of which block. And, um, and, and in addition, the inputs and the outputs of, of these recurrent nets, instead of being normal vectors, there are sets, sets of vectors, which you can think of sets of objects. So, so the classical way of thinking in neural nets is like in a deep net, right? You, you have a vector 
that the output of one layer becomes the input of the next one and we produce the next vector, the next vector, the next vector, right? So, so we just have these vectors that we're processing. Um, and that's, that's, that's cool, but if we want this kind of more dynamic computation, it's convenient to think of um, sets. So sets, uh, that's just unordered tuples. And the elements in the sets are like one of the things I could be thinking about. They're objects. Um, and they have attributes. Um, it turns out we can represent these kinds of things in neural nets. In fact, it already exists. You can find that, even though people don't say it, in transformers. Transformers use attention, soft attention, and they actually propagate from one level to the next. Sets. The, the order doesn't matter in, in a transformer. Uh, you, you stick in particular attributes that help figure out you know, which came first, but, but really it's just part of the attributes. It's not, it's not sequence processing, it's set processing. All right, so, so I think these kinds of architectures will be important on, on our path towards uh, high-level cognition. Um, and and um, yeah, we've started to experiment with that. And, and, and one of the interesting things with these sort of architectures is something we don't usually measure is uh, what I mentioned earlier, out of distribution generalization. So for example, we train on sequences uh, up to a particular length, and we want to measure how you perform on, on longer sequences. Or you, you train on images of a particular size, and you want to generalize on images of a different size. Um, so, so these uh, more modular architectures turn out to be really good at this form of out of distribution generalization. And how are we doing the time? What time is it? Ooh, okay. So last topic. Last topic. So I mentioned causality at the beginning is one of the hallmarks of high-level cognitions. Uh, we, we want these high-level variables that I keep talking about, that we want to be able to recombine in new ways and, and, and operate on in new ways. Um, at least many of them uh, should correspond to causal variables. So what is a causal variable? Well, that's an interesting question. Like, pixels are not causal variables. In other words, you cannot find a causal relationship between two pixels in an image. It's not like one pixel causes another pixel. It doesn't make any sense. And if you, if you use like, statistical methods to try to figure out whether a pixel here is a cause of pixel here, you won't be able to show that it's true. However, high-level concepts like it's raining on one hand and somebody opens up their umbrella on the other hand, well, these kinds of concepts, they have causal relationships. And you can, you can discover, there are methods that people have been proposing to discover that uh, A is a cause of B or B is a cause of A. Right? So this is something that we're starting to incorporate in machine learning. Um, and the particular question that I'm very interested in that has to do with deep learning is how do we discover these causal variables? So, so people in, uh, in uh, like physics and uh, epidemiology and social sciences and so on, have been thinking about causality. Like, you know, uh, is is uh, smoking uh, causing cancer? Right. So, so in that case, we can observe all kinds of things. Uh, we can sometimes do experiments, and we can then figure out whether smoking causes cancer with some probability. But for a baby or a robot, um, let's say that doesn't speak yet it doesn't get to see the token smoking and the token cancer. What it sees are just images and sounds. Right? Um, and as I said, the pixels are not causal variables. So you need to learn a representation, a mapping from the raw data to the right high-level space where uh, uh, these variables would be good candidates for being a cause or effect of each other. So, so that's one of the questions we've been looking at. Um, and um, yeah, let me skip this and just mention this. Um, so, so in order to discover the causal structure and which are the variables, we've been exploiting um, a, a hypothesis, which comes from the, the, the perspective that the reason, for the most part, things change in the world, that there are changes in distribution, due to the actions, or also known as interventions, of agents. 
And when a, a, you know an agent is a physical entity, and and you know I I'm I'm at a particular place in time, and I cannot control everything in the world in, in, in you know, one instant, I will be able to do one thing, like turn off the switch, right? Um, and so the changes tend to be like this. The, the, if, if I were to represent information in the right way, where one of the variables, one of the dimensions of that space is whether the, spit, the switch is on or off, uh, then the change in distribution will be localized. Um, so uh, if I don't have the right space of representation, like if I try to represent things at, at the pixel level and somebody turns off the light, uh, the distribution changes as I mentioned earlier, but it'll be hard to represent that change. It's like I would have to retrain my whole model. But if I were to represent the information that comes to me at this high level where I just ha happen to have the right variables that uh, are the ones which are going to be locally changed by, by you know, agents in the world, uh, then I'm going to be more robust to these changes in distribution because I don't need a lot of observations. Like, in fact, I need a single observation to figure out if the lights are off that somebody turned off the switch, right? Um, whereas uh, if, I, if I don't have that concept, it's going to just be very difficult. I'm going to need to retrain my whole brain. Um, and so what, we are, what we've been doing is say, well, well, this is nice. Like, if we had the right representation, we could generalize quickly to new cha to changes in distribution. But we don't have the right representation. So how do we get it? Well, we use this property that um, good representations lead to fast generalization to find good representations because we can we can train our system so that it will generalize faster. And what we learn through this training are the representations that will have the property that you generalize faster and that the changes are localized. So, so this is the kind of thing we've been doing and, uh, and, and it seems to work. Um, okay, so I'm going to stop here because otherwise, who knows? Uh, oh, let, let, let me just have that slide. So I've covered a lot of ground and I also left out some slides. Um, but, but in summary, some of the things I've been saying are pointing in a direction where it's not enough to train our model on a, like a, a single particular task. People already know that. We really, if we want to make serious progress towards human level AI, at some point we need to build models that understand our world at the same level as humans. Now, maybe tomorrow morning we can't do that. We don't have the compute power and the sensors and so on. Uh, but we might be able to, to do it in a virtual environment. Uh, we might be able to do it in a more specialized uh, environment uh, where we, we, we want to design algorithms that can figure out a world model for their environment. How does their environment work? And uh, that includes understanding of the causal structure. That includes understanding of the, the relationships between the variables at the high level so that the, the, the the model can imagine how things could be and forecast and um, produce plans um, and um, take advantage of the fact that they are not passive in the environment, that they can act on the environment in order to discover causal structure and also to, to acquire knowledge. Right? So, so one of the cool things about being an agent by opposition to just given a data set and trying to figure out the distribution is that you can purposely do things for the purpose of acquiring knowledge, just like babies do all the time. That's what playing is about. That's what boredom is about. Um, and then finally, my last uh, message is hopefully I've tried to convince you um, that neural nets could be extended using mechanisms based on attention to uh, go you know, from system one, where they're currently good, towards system two, which is a sort of high-level cognition. Thank you very much.